If you can uh, see that uh, I have a smile on my face, uh, it's, for, it's for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, I'm able to talk about or be part of a subject that I care about deeply. And I am supposed to care about everything at UNESCO because I'm the chief of media services. And so there is always something coming across my plate. My name is George Papianis, and I will be your moderator for this program. I'm also smiling because we have an incredible panel and distinguished speakers who have come here today to begin the process of motivating us toward the ocean decade. I'm gonna share just a very brief story from my childhood. I, I grew up on an island, it's called Manhattan. I took the subway to the beach on weekends with my parents. And I can remember the excitement as we would approach, we would approach the beach and the sound of the ocean waves were crashing on the shore and you could smell that salt air and you could hear people enjoying themselves. And the first thing I wanted to do was to run into that water and begin to scoop it up. And there were times when I would scoop up the water and I would look into it in the palm of my hands and flecks of sand glinted in the sunlight. Sometimes I even caught a sand crab in there. And I thought to myself, it's as if I have the whole world in the palm of my hand. Well, I think one of the reasons that we're here today is that we hold the future of the whole world in the palm of our hand. As we think about how we protect one of the most important natural resources on the planet, the ocean. So, there's a lot of work to do in the next 90 minutes. There's some great people to listen to. And we also want to make sure that you are a part of all of this. So, I'm going to begin with a bit of housekeeping. I believe we should have the pompier and security in the room. If we don't, I will let you know if there's any reason for you to flee. I don't think there will be. The conversation and discussion will be so engaging that you'll be riveted to your seats. But just in case, there's an exit in the, behind you on that side of the room, in the corner, on that side of the room, and there are two exits in that side. In terms of security, the security priority for us is protecting the ocean. I want to welcome the fact that we have a global audience joining us as well. This event is going to be webcast. And so in addition to that, all of you who are here participating in person, there's a great opportunity to hear from others from around the world. There'll be interpretation, English, French, so if it's necessary, please feel free to use the headphones and you'll be able to follow the conversation in your language of choice. So how are we going to engage throughout this wonderful event that we've pulled together? How are we going to include people from the far reaches of the planet? Well, if you look up into the four corners of this wonderful room, which is room 10, the room of the executive board, one of our, one of our governing bodies uh, here at UNESCO, in this beautiful room, look into the, the corners, and you'll see that we have something up there that says slido.com, join at slido.com. And at this point in time, uh, I'm going to tell you to do something that nobody ever tells you in a meeting. I'm going to tell you to take out your phones. Yes, grab that mobile, turn it on. Open up a web browser in your mobile and go to slido.com. This is how you are going to participate in this meeting. We are using this mobile-friendly web platform as a way for you to interact with us. On this web platform, when you go to slido.com, you will see 
a, a very simple interface. It'll say event code. Enter the event code, hashtag ocean decade. As you see, hashtag ocean decade. Now, why are we doing this? It's an important part of, of inclusiveness. Very often, the situation in conferences is that 75% of the people who are attending don't really ask a question, although they might want to. But this is a way to participate and to, and to improve inclusiveness. It also allows us for an opportunity to include those who are watching from anywhere in the world on this webcast. So I want us to be inclusive of a global audience. I want you all to be able to participate. And I want you to use the Slido.com platform for engaging with us. Because there'll be a few things that we're going to do over the course of the next 90 minutes. We want your questions. We want your comments. But we also want to take the temperature of the room at different times. So there'll be a number of polls that we are going to do. So let's go to our first poll, which is already up on the screen, but it's on your Slido platform. And from that poll, we're going to ask you to identify who you are. So which kind of ocean stakeholder are you? Are you a member state? Are you an NGO, a uh, scientist or an expert? Are you from the private sector? Or are you from just another interested party? So let's see how those numbers begin to, uh, to reflect. And we see that uh, member states are among uh, the uh, largest number, at least right now. And I would say that that is probably a reading of the room and not necessarily the global audience. So we're going to ask you now, as we are getting that, I noticed that we have the pompier in the back of the room. So I'm going to invite him to come forward and uh, say a few words. Sur le micro. Merci. Mesdames, Messieurs, bonjour. Bienvenue à la maison de l'UNESCO. Mes collègues de la Sûreté à l'extérieur et moi-même sommes là pour votre sécurité et le bon déroulement de cette manifestation. Nous vous demandons de ne pas encombrer les allées de circulation Si une évacuation est nécessaire, une sirène d'alarme et un message vous en avertira. Nous vous demanderons alors de sortir dans le calme par les issues de secours qui sont derrière vous et en face de vous. Merci de votre attention et bonne journée. Merci beaucoup. Okay, so we've gotten done with uh, some of that housekeeping and we can take a closer look at uh, what's on the uh, poll. I'm going to go to this one here, which is a little bit closer to me. So we have 39% uh, or so are a part of the uh, member states. Uh, we have 34% among other uh, NGOs at approximately 20%. And we have 7, 6 to 7% of our audience uh, among scientists and experts. So we will go back to Slido from time to time throughout this, throughout this 90 minute event. Um, and we'll use it as a way to keep the conversation going and to be inclusive, as I've already stated. The question, of course, that we want, to, we want to bring to all of us is what are we doing about this idea of an ocean decade? And how are we going to inform the process? We have these great speakers and experts who are in the room today. The ocean decade, of course, is a way for us to catalyze and to raise awareness, to bring ocean science to the fore, to put it in the right hands. That requires an, a complete pantheon of participants getting involved from the man on the street, from the woman on the street, all the way up to a president, the head of a general, of a, of a, um, of a general assembly, a national assembly, from the United Nations to your local government. These words need to be spoken, but what words will they be, and what messages are we, going to bring, are we going to bring? So, before I introduce our first guests, we're going to uh, watch our first video, and that first video is 
telling us we about shall. the international, I'm sorry, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. We share one ocean. It provides the oxygen we breathe. It feeds us and regulates our climate, yet we barely understand its mysteries. A million species could still wait to be discovered, but human impacts are threatening the ocean's fragile ecosystems and the benefits it provides us. No single nation can solve these challenges. Only by working together to build our scientific knowledge can we hope to find the solutions we need to protect our shared ocean. The Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO is a global community that enables nations to work together, to study the ocean and observe its changes, to sustainably manage marine resources, and to provide early warnings of hazards such as tsunamis. Global efforts to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals depend on a healthy ocean. So join us in making 2021 to 2030 the International Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. So together, we can build the knowledge we need to protect and sustain the one ocean that unites us all. If it, yes, let's get an applause. If it wasn't for the fact that Ambassador Peter Thompson has taken on this Herculean task of uh, taking us into the decade, I think he'd have a, a great career as a, nar a narrator of, uh, of movies. Ambassador Thompson, thank you so much for uh, bringing that to life for us. Remember, to be part of the conversation, just you see it up there, we want you to use slido.com. Don't forget the hashtag uh, for the event code, which is hashtag Ocean Decade. At this time, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome our first speakers for our opening remarks, the Director General of UNESCO, Irina Bokova, and Bjorn Hochstad, the uh, Vice Minister of the Ministry of Education and Research of the Government of Norway. Director General Irina Bokova is gonna be leaving us in a few days as she comes to the end of her second mandate. Over these eight years, much has been accomplished on calm seas and clear sailing, and as one might guess at times, through trying times and troubled waters. But one thing that was always there was a steady hand at the helm. And for that, we are very grateful. It is my pleasure to introduce Madam Irina Bokova, the Director General of UNESCO. Uh -huh. Very much, uh, George. Um ministers, uh, deputy ministers, uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, uh, it is indeed uh, with uh, certain kind of emotion I'm, I'm standing among you because it has been uh, for me eight fascinating years, including eight years into the defense of, uh, of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, the ocean, uh, launching uh, many new initiatives. But uh, let me just say that it's a kind of a gift to have so many friends of the ocean here today on the margins of the 39th General Conference. Um, of course, it's a privilege uh, to have Mr. Bjorn Hochstad, the Vice Minister uh, of the Ministry of Education and Research of, uh, of Norway, uh, Peter Hogan, who has been leading the uh, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, uh, Professor uh, Noor uh, Ayeni Hach Mohtar, the Vice Chancellor of the University of uh, Malaysia, uh, Terengani, uh, my dear friend uh, Romain Trouble, the Executive Director of the Tara Foundation, and also with whom we launched uh, our joint platform, uh, uh, Ocean and Climate. Uh, and also uh, the Ocean Climate Initiative uh, Alliance. And of course, uh, last but definitely not least, uh, is Ambassador Peter Thompson. I was just worried that uh, uh, when the, the documentary came and I heard the voice, uh, I said, where do I know this voice? I know it so well, this voice. Uh, uh, and then I, I looked around and I said, it's close, 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 very close. <laughs> and then I didn't see it at the end. And I said, it's not possible. Uh, it appeared, but uh, I would say, Say uh, one planet, uh, one ocean, one voice, the voice of uh, Ambassador Peter Thompson, but many, many voices should be the right way to, uh, to, uh, the right way to uh, uh, finish uh, this, uh, uh, this important uh, documentary. 
Now, I would like to thank all of you, uh, experts, uh, ministers, uh, researchers, uh, civil society groups, uh, uh, to come uh, to us uh, at UNESCO. Uh, and uh, I would say, uh, probably uh, for us, for UNESCO, this is the most important event after the groundbreaking conference uh, in New York um, on, uh, on the Ocean Conference, which was uh, led the initiative of uh, uh, Ambassador Peter Thompson, at that time President of the General Assembly of the United Nations. And this gives me again opportunity to thank him for his continued leadership in his new uh, now role as United Nations Special Envoy uh, for the Ocean, uh, because I do believe that we need to strengthen the international action in the protection of the ocean. We all know that our survival depends on the sustainability of the ocean, speaking about oxygen, climate, water, food, uh, and uh, one can continue this list. Uh, it provides half of the annual um, uh, production of the oxygen we breathe. It's the main uh, climate regulator that exists on the Earth. It's a main source of proteins for more than a quarter of the uh, human beings. And yet, and we have said it many times, uh, uh, emphasized that we have only limited knowledge of the ocean. We have explored just 2% of it, and we protect less than 5%. Uh, very often we say that sometimes we know more about the space, we know more about the stars than we know about the ocean. And at the same time, we have started already a massive movement to exploit the, the ocean's resources, making plan on a blue economy that is estimated to generate over 350 million jobs. So the way to manage the ocean is definitely not what we call a gold rush mentality. We need, first and foremost, better, sharper knowledge. We have to understand the ocean to manage the sustainability of ecosystems and biodiversity, and to know better still its role in climate change. The good news is that more than 35% of the commitments made at the United Nations Ocean Conference relate to scientific knowledge, to research capacity, and to marine technology. This is why we consider that our UNESCO's work and advocacy is so important. UNESCO is working all across the board to enhance ocean science through our, I would say, flagship, one of our flagships, its uh, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. We publish the Global Ocean Science Report for the first time as an essential tool to provide data on scientific capacities to, access, to assess progress. And we launched also something that I mentioned before with uh, uh, Romain Tromblet, the Ocean and Climate uh, 2015 the platform. It was before the um, uh, Paris uh, uh, Climate Agreement, a very important moment uh, uh, for all of us. And we brought the civil society research community to include uh, the ocean in all solutions relating to climate change. I believe that this tireless advocacy that uh, we jointly have made, we at UNESCO, researchers, um, uh, governments, uh, 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 activists, uh, brought and shaped the Sustainable Development Goal 14 that we are also proud of, which is dedicated to the conservation and sustainable use of the ocean, seas, and the marine resources. I would like also once again to commend Ambassador Peter Thompson, because I know that he was behind the driving force behind uh, being a permanent delegate of Fiji at, uh, in New York, uh, uh, behind the uh, adoption of this uh, uh, goal, which is a set alone goal uh, dedicated to the sustainability of the ocean. The advantage of UNESCO, and I want to emphasize it here, the advantage of UNESCO is that we are having the Intergovernmental Commission, but at the same time, we have the education. We emphasize education for sustainable development, education for the ocean, ocean literacy. We have the uh, programs of uh, um, underwater uh, cultural heritage sites. We have the biosphere reserves, and all these, the protected areas, marine areas, make us uh, um, uh, think that uh, they are not only laboratory of ideas, but they are a lachmus of what is happening in the ocean when it comes to climate change and to the protection of biodiversity. Alors, mesdames et messieurs, nous avons parcouru un long chemin en aidant à prendre conscience de l'importance de l'océan, mais nous devons aller beaucoup plus loin, et je dirais plus vite, pour relever des défis qui vont au-delà des capacités d'un seul pays. L'élévation du niveau de la mer, 
les défis des réfugiés climatiques, l'accélération des phénomènes extrêmes et des risques naturels. Aucun pays, aussi puissant soit-il, ne peut aborder seul ces enjeux. Nous avons besoin d'un nouvel engagement pour la coopération, de nouveaux investissements, de nouveaux partenariats, en particulier pour les pays en développement. Je crois que c'est le sens de la proposition de l'UNESCO pour une décennie des Nations Unies de l'océanologie au service du développement durable 2021-2030, afin de fournir un cadre global de la mise en œuvre du programme 2030 pour ce qui concerne l'environnement marin. La coopération et la diplomatie scientifique sont essentielles. La mer, disait Jacques Cousteau, est la grande unificatrice et le seul espoir de l'homme. Maintenant, comme jamais, ce vieil adage doit être compris au sens littéral. Nous sommes tous dans le même bateau. L'UNESCO est un lieu pour transformer cette sagesse millénaire en politique concrète, pour un changement réel, pour une notion durable et une terre plus habitable. Merci pour votre attention. At this time, I'd like to now introduce Bjorn Hoxted, the Vice Minister of the Ministry of Education and Research in Norway. And as part of my introduction, I would also like to acknowledge the uh, generosity of the people of Norway uh, for uh, helping to support uh, this event and to be so committed to uh, the oceans. Uh, of course, all of this manifested in the government's commitment uh, to these important issues. The other thing is, as the Vice Minister of education and research, it would seem to me that you have quite a full plate ahead of you with this ocean decade looming. Thank you, Director General, ladies and gentlemen, friends of the ocean. It's an honor to be here. And I would like to start by thanking Director General Bokova for her wise introduction and for her immense effort for strengthening the position and work of UNESCO for the last eight years. Director General, thank you. In the distant past, the ocean gave rise to life as we know it. It still does. Keeping the ocean healthy is thus a matter of life itself. SDG 14 stresses the importance of both conserving and sustainable use of the oceans, which is very much in line with Norwegian policy. Estimates predict a doubling of the ocean's contribution to global value creation by 2030. But this potential will not be realized unless we keep the ocean healthy. Today we are focusing on the SDG 14, the ocean goal. But the ocean is of vital important, importance to most sustainable development goals, not least the goals to end poverty, to end hunger, and to combat climate change. We thus have every reason to focus on the ocean, to preserve and manage it. Norway is an ocean nation, and we have always been so. The ocean has always been a source for survival and riches, and a route to friends, allies, and trade partners. Thousands of years ago, thousands, thousands of years ago, the Norwegian Vikings were a bit rough in the practices, these days, we emphasize peaceful cooperation. The ocean has been considered unchangeable, constant, and without limits. It has been the provider of food and a recipient of waste. Now we are facing reality. Our common ocean is changing, and it thus has limits. The list of grave, grave problems is long. Acidification, litter, and loss of biodiversity are but a few. On the positive side, we now witness an unprecedented attention and momentum in the global community to save the ocean. The UN Ocean Conference in New York was a milestone. The last our ocean conference in Malta is another example of important gatherings, and I'm happy to remind you all that our Ocean 2019 will take place in Oslo, in Norway. In Norway, 
The ocean is high on the political agenda. Last year, the government has presented a new strategy for sustainable growth in ocean industries. We launched a white paper on the role of the oceans in Norwegian foreign and development policy, and a white paper on the update of the integrated management plan for the Norwegian Sea. In our long-term plan for research and higher education, the ocean is one of the top priorities. The awareness and the shared feeling of urgency are growing among politicians, researchers, institutions, and indeed the general public at large. Even though we have to act nationally and locally, the health and sustainability of the ocean is not a national matter. This is truly global. We need international cooperation and the pooling of knowledge, resources, and joint action. We welcome wholeheartedly the appointment of Peter Thompson as the UN Special Envoy for the Ocean. Prime Minister Solberg underlined in her statement that the increased focus on the challenges and opportunities relating to the world's oceans is crucial if we are to achieve sustainable development. She continued with announcing that Norway will provide support and funding for the Secretary General's Special Envoy and that Norway is looking forward to cooperating with him closely. The IOC has proposed an international decade for ocean research for sustainable development, a proposal fully supported by Norway. Under the leadership of IOC Chair Haugan and Ex Executive Secretary Ryabdin, I feel confident that the international decade will make significant contributions to giving us the ocean we need for the future we want. Thank you. Well, with these opening remarks, we've already got a few things that we need to think about. And we're going to go to our second poll uh, and get your opinion on uh, what key action should the decade of ocean science accomplish by 2030. So that's what key action should the decade of ocean science accomplish by 2030. And we'll be able to see what the responses are. Remember, it's slido.com. If you haven't already checked in and you're following us through our webcast, you go to slido.com and for the event code, put in hashtag Ocean Decade, and you can be part of this conversation with comments, questions, and responses to the poll. We have a couple of very important special addresses that uh, we are going to uh, move into at this time. Uh, the first is from Ambassador Peter Thompson, uh, the narrator who is here with us in the flesh, as well as the Minister of Education of, uh, of Sweden, Gustav Friedelin. On September 12th, Ambassador Thompson was named the Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Ocean. He has served as a president of the 71st session of the United Nations General Assembly. And overall, he has more than 30 years of public service experience, and his story is still being written. Ambassador Thompson, it's an honor to have you with us. Thank you very much, George. Uh, I'll put on this stopwatch here because when I uh, start talking about the ocean, uh, it's difficult to stop me, and I think you've given me seven minutes. So, uh, Director General Vakova and uh, Excellencies, um, uh, Vice Minister, uh, ladies and gentlemen, great pleasure to be here. Uh, I hope to be spending a lot more time with you. Uh, there's a good possibility that I'll be opening the office uh, for the Special Envoy here in Paris uh, early uh, next year sometime. Uh, but uh, for the purpose of today, uh, I, I want to speak uh, strongly in support of the international uh, decade of ocean science for sustainable development, and I'll give you my reasons why. Uh, but uh, first of all, I'm sure there's nobody in the room that I need to tell that the, the ocean is in deep trouble. I think there is now global consciousness on the fact that we can't just carry on with what we've always done of treating the ocean as a place to dump our rubbish and exploit, that it's actually essential to our survival on this planet that we uh, get back to having a healthy ocean and maintain a healthy ocean. 
So I think that uh, the world is, is aware of that now. I'm very aware that we've got ministers of education present, and I know that young people in particular are engaged with this, that whether it's marine pollution or ocean acidification or ocean warming, or whether it's deoxygenization or overcapacity of fishing fleets, chasing diminishing fish stocks or degraded coastal ecosystems, the whole plethora of woes that humanity has brought upon the ocean, that the knowledge is out there now that we've done that. And because these are human-induced problems, that we have to find human solutions to them. And uh, the good news is that we are identifying those solutions. So what we're now in is a phase of implementation, a phase of implementing solutions so that by 2030, and the reason that date is important would be known to most of you, which is the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, uh, that, that, that in, by 2030, when that matures, that we have to be back into a situation of balance with the ocean uh, and one in which uh, the ocean has the integrity, which most of us were born into. Uh, coming from Fiji, uh, I have seen in my lifetime how that beautiful resource has been uh, degraded, whether it be coral reefs or whether it be the trash that uh, floats up onto our beaches from, distant, from uh, countries thousands and thousands of miles away from us. So uh, I, I want you to all know that uh, you know, those of you who are not familiar with SDG 14 need to be, because we have a plan to save life in the ocean. We have a plan. It's been agreed by everybody. When I say everybody, all 193 uh, countries in the, in the member states of the, of the United Nations agreed to this plan. It's a universal one. It's called Sustainable Development Goal 14, and it has 10 targets, and they cover those uh, problems that I was talking about earlier and guide us towards, by the year 2030, uh, 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 implementing all those solutions. I should say that, the, that many of the, uh, the 10 targets actually mature before 2030, but I won't go into detail on that at this stage. Uh, so uh, the, the one thing that is essential, though, for us to achieve those 10 targets of SDG 14 is that all of our decisions and all of our actions are based on the proper information, uh, that, that it's not just hearsay or it's not just uh, let's, what's uh, loosely called common sense. It actually is uh, a, a subject that requires good science for us to make decisions. You know, uh, fish stocks need to be measured. Ocean acid uh, acidification needs to be measured. Uh, ways of introducing resilience to coral reefs before they're gone forever. Uh, these all need good science for us to make good decisions. So uh, if you look at SDG 14, you'll see that the eighth target is actually related to improving our knowledge of marine science uh, and uh, to uh, research on the ocean and, in fact, to uh, transfer of technology as well amongst us all, particularly to developing countries. Because when it comes to the ocean, there is only one ocean. Uh, the old uh, Mare Nostrum uh, view of, of, of oceans, that somehow they belong to certain powerful countries as the Romans thought the Mediterranean was theirs, uh, that, that is just nonsense. There's, there's one planet which is the common heritage of mankind, and we all have this responsibility to understand what's happening out there in that ocean, uh, and so that we can make the right decisions. So um, I want uh, to emphasize that point, that without good science, we're not going to make good decisions, and if we're not going to make good decisions, we're not going to have success by uh, 2030 when the SDG 14 matures. So the International Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development is, uh, is a timely one. Um, let me give you another reason why that timing is so important. And I can see George closing in, but according to my stopwatch, I've still got another two minutes. Uh, and uh, the reason that, um, that, that uh, the, the science aspect is so important, uh, sorry, that the timing aspect is so important, 2021 to 2030. Uh, as I said earlier, the SDG 14, the plan to save life in the ocean, matures in 2030. So that decade uh, will be taking us through uh, to that maturation point. Um, there is another reason, which is that in 2020, uh, we are pushing for a second uh, United Nations Ocean Conference to be held in 2020. Uh, 
the thing to understand about these UN ocean conferences is these are the only moments when humanity as a whole comes together and makes decisions about what will be done uh, to uh, save life in our ocean. This is the only time when we're all bound together by one agreement. Even the, uh, the United Nations law of the sea is not a universal agreement, but SDG 14 is. And so it's at a UN conference that we can make universal decisions. So that 2020 conference, very important because it's going to shape us for that final decade of implementing SDG 14. And that's where the IOC's uh, suggestion of having this uh, international decade of marine science from 2021 to 2030 just fits in so perfectly. So uh, I, I think that's probably the right uh, note for me to conclude on because I see my stopwatch now tells me that my seven minutes are up. Thank you, George. Thank you very much, Ambassador Thompson. You, you aptly identified what I call my two-minute stroll. We are also joined today by Gustav Friedel, the Minister of Education of Sweden, where he has served since 2014. The minister and I also have uh, something in common. We both uh, were reporters at one time. I think you were at TV4. I actually was at TV5. Of course, we were separated by an ocean. Uh, more importantly, however, there's a lot of news coming out of Sweden, and I want to turn it over to you. Uh, Sweden is co-president of the UN Ocean Conference together with Fiji, and one can only imagine that ocean literacy and education is going to be one of your priorities. It's an honor to have you with us, Minister. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thanks for this uh, perfect and very important event uh, at uh, the General Conference. And I would uh, start by sending all the best wishes and strength to this important event from my uh, colleague as co-leader of the Swedish Greens and Deputy Prime Minister of Sweden, Isabella Levine, who acted as uh, co-president at the UN Ocean Conference together with a representative from Fiji. Uh, the Ocean Conference was such an impressive global manifestation in support of the conservation and sustainable use of the oceans. And it built further political momentum for the implementation of Goal 14. The conference adopted, as you know, uh, and has been said, an ambitious political declaration, but maybe even more important, generated over 1,400 voluntary commitments and counting from a diversity of stakeholders. We now all have a shared responsibility to keep up that pace in the implementation of all commitments made at both the UN conferences. Uh, as Peter Thompson so clearly pointed out, it's urgent and we do have the plan. What we now need to see happen is the action and keeping up the pace in that action and actually in some ways making that pace go even faster if we want to keep up with the goals set that in SDG 14. And UNESCO has made a great job to take on the Agenda 2030 in the work in the, for the years to come. Did important voluntary commitments to the conference on ocean literacy as well as on marine spatial planning. And the Swedish government is clear to thank uh, the UNESCO for that and, and the active follow-up from that conference that is this event. <clears throat> if we want to save our oceans, education is in the key for that. Uh, goal 4 and 14 are interdependent. And Sweden welcomed that UNESCO strongly highlighted the need for ocean literacy at the Ocean Conference. The UNESCO's voluntary commitment on ocean literacy for all was important, and we are happy to be possible, that it's possible for us to contribute to its implementation. The Swedish government has, for the next year, proposed an, an historic budget to strengthen work on environment and climate. And a large part of it is devoted to improve oceans and seas. And in our budget, we will direct money to strengthen ocean literacy in all Swedish schools. We will give special focus to the issues the three years to come. We are many countries that now are taking the work and the pledges and the uh, contribution, contributions that we left on the Ocean Conference back home 
And it's so important to see that it actually happens, to follow up in the budgets, in the legislations, in the campaigns made, in the, uh, uh, in the budgets for science, that what we have said to be happen is also happening in each country. Sweden is doing its part there, and we will be happy to help and happy to assist, and we'll also be happy to see UNESCO work with uh, all member states to make sure that its contribution, its pledges, and uh, what's been said at the Ocean Conference is actually happening in each country. Thank you very much, Minister. It was again a pleasure to have you with us. And if I may, just a round of applause for all of our speakers who have helped set the stage for what will be the oncoming roundtable. Please, thanking our speakers. I Pardon me. I want to draw your attention to uh, the, uh, the poll that uh, we uh, went to uh, just before we engaged uh, with our speakers. What key action should the decade of ocean science accomplish by 2030? And it's, it's a pretty um, in, uh, mixed, I would say. There's a balance, uh, but uh, nearly 30% say education and communication. We have research, observations, and mapping at 22%. Capacity building, capacity development is uh, at, you're moving that on me, Vinny. <laughs> capacity development is at 22%. Information and policy making at 22%. And I think that covers the entire uh, range of, uh, ish of, of questions or options that we had for that particular poll. So education uh, at, the, at the top of, uh, of the agenda. At this point in the program, we're now going to shift to the roundtable discussion. And it is an opportunity for uh, us to hear from some of the experts who have joined us today uh, in a bit more detail uh, to find out uh, more about what are the key elements that we need to be thinking about as we move forward and try to inform this ocean decade. You're going to notice that there are probably, in generality now, four areas of focus. Number one, why do we need an ocean decade. The second, planning a way forward for the ocean decade. The third, building capacity and technology transfer. And the last, catalyzing ocean science within civil society. So those four, those four areas are the, basically what are going to be the four general topics that we're going to hear about as we progress through the balance of our program. And again, as I mentioned earlier, these are pieces to a puzzle. The question is, how do we make them fit? How do we bring them together? And that's something in which we want to hear from you about as we go through this part of the process. It's important that we hear from those of you in the room. And also, let us not forget that we have people who are joining us via a webcast. And they're able to participate again through slido.com. For those who may have joined in the midst of this conversation from afar, go to slido.com. And there, where it says code event, enter hashtag ocean decade. You'll be able to comment, participate, offer questions, and participate in our polls. So what we're going to do is leave time as well for questions at the end of the four, present, of the four presentations. Um, but I will, I will allow for a couple of questions, like clarifying questions, after each of the presentations. But again, because I think we all agree that these are not in standalones, that they are actually supposed to be integrated, I want, I want us to, to, to think about this as we get then to the final presentation, following that, to have our questions about how we bring it all together. And, and, and that's going to be an important way of informing the process for the uh, ocean decade. Now let's bring up our next poll. It's a simple one. Uh, this poll is, how well do you think we know the ocean? Now what do we mean by we? Humanity, people, the general public. How well do we know the ocean? And if you think we know it quite well, well, then it's a five. And if you think that there's really very, very little knowledge about the ocean, 
Well, then it's a one. And so already some of the poll numbers are coming, are coming in. And uh, we can see that, uh, generally speaking, uh, nobody thinks that uh, we have a very good knowledge of the ocean. I guess of about 1%, that looks like to me, maybe uh, think that there is even a very good knowledge. We're really in the unknown. And we cannot afford to allow ourselves to be ignorant about how we proceed. And we're going to start to fill that information gap right now with the first of our roundtable discussions. And it is my, but before we go there, we're going to watch another video about the Global Ocean Science Report. You know, for the first time, uh, we present a report which shows what are the capabilities around the world in terms of measuring the ocean, understanding the ocean, what human resources are there out there. So, you know, uh, there is this uh, buzz phrase, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So this also applies to science itself. So we decided to measure the science. And this is the first attempt for us to, to measure who is doing what, what are the resources? What are the capacities? Investment in, in the science uh, about the ocean is just 0.04 to 4% in the different countries, which is, I would say, negligible. Well, not surprisingly, the capability is, is very uneven around the world. I mean, we have major players who have infrastructure, who have vessels, who have capabilities, and others which, which do not. And so I guess the one key message is how do we make these things work together in a, in, a, in a good way? How do we take the capabilities that exist in some places and make them available uh, for, 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 the, for the rest of the world? We start to understand a lot. We have brains that are good enough, but you know the investment, the knowledge is not sufficient for good action and we really need to develop that. We know something about the role of the ocean in climate change and in climate variability. We measure the heat uptake and so on, but there's an awful lot of things we don't know. And I'm much more optimistic nowadays that uh, uh, there is a, a huge, I would say, convergence of uh, ambitions, ambitions on the part of uh, member states, on the part of governments. Uh, a very strong drive from the private sector. I think it cannot be stopped. Exactly the process of deciding which investments to do is something we need a, a body like the IOC to do that. Because scientists would like to measure everything all the time. Uh, and, and then there's a question, what are the priorities? We have a great partner. This is the French company Suez, which is in the, uh, in the energy sector that supports a lot of our activities in the ocean. And uh, I discussed uh, with the CEO of uh, this company, and he reassured me. He said, whatever governments uh, may uh, decide sometimes uh, to slow down, to go faster, the process is unleashed, and we are investing in new technologies. We are investing in green technologies, also the exploration of the ocean. So all this gives me a lot of hope. I think we have to end on that note. All of this gives me a lot of hope. There are huge challenges out there. I think we recognize it. We look at the poll numbers. We can see that there is an information gap that we need to fill. Vladimir Ryabinin, the Executive Secretary of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, even cites that issue in the, in the video itself. And it's my pleasure to introduce him to you as well. He has been the Executive Secretary of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission since uh, March of 2015. We take a look at the poll, kind of gives us an idea of what we're up against. Um, and is this a call to having an ocean decade that is aspirational as well as uh, potentially reasonable in terms of boosting international cooperation in ocean science? Thank you very much, George. And, uh you know, I think I, I will try to give you a more or less a scientific presentation. Uh, we have all uh, managerial reasons uh, to, to, uh, to, to start the decade, but let me just uh, frighten you a little bit and show to you the real uh, state of affairs in this field. You know, I really wanted to, to do it in a very succinct way, and for me uh, to do this, it would be to focus on the three major areas of activities of IUC. This would be healthy and productive ocean, resilience to climate change variability, and safety of people. And of course, they all depend on science. 
So, um, you know, in principle, we have to use the ocean, and this is what we call blue economy, which has to be sustainable. But they have some showstoppers. The blue economy may actually, as Vice Minister said, grow twice by 2030. But we have some very significant problems in the ocean. And not an uh, exhaustive set of this would include pollution. And this also is a science-intensive topic because, for example, plastics and microplastics, there is a lot of unknowns there. Also, in not of unknowns in how we treat, treat them, and what are the substitutes, because some substitutes create more harm than the normal plastic. Then, acidification. It's a totally new thing, the other side of the climate, climate problem. And if carbon, carbon gets to the water, it remains there for thousands of years. So we have to do uh, some research how to adjust the life to this carbon. Then, oxygen and the dead zones in the ocean. There are more than 500 dead zones in the ocean. So uh, this also requires, there are at least five reasons to have these dead zones. So we need to study them and predict them. Then algal blooms. We are going to have um, a system to predict uh, the algal blooms. And they are harmful for fish, harmful for people. They have to be predicted. They are harmful for water to, to, do, to do salinations. Then, uh, Sometimes we have oil spills. Now we're embarking on the production of oil. Is this? Then, uh, of course, comes illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing. Basically, criminal fishing, and also some fraud in the seafood sector. Addressing this also requires predictions, transparency based on science, and some observations. So what would be the approach to, to address this? The approach is known. The approach is coastal zone management, maritime special planning that also require significant science. And the target of IOC would be to achieve uh, by 2030, 50% of the total area of exclusive economic zones covered by governmentally approved maritime special plans. This will require observations, but also new observations. For example, observations of ocean uh, life in the ocean. And we do this through the Ocean Biogeographic Information System for the whole world. But we also need to take some actions. One of these actions will be the total science that is required to restore coral reefs, but not only them, the ecosystems around the coral reefs that stri strives the coral reefs. And of course, we don't know a lot about ocean ecosystems, particularly <coughs> deep ocean ecosystems. Some of them were just discovered. So geographical discoveries in the ocean are still possible, and even some scientific discoveries are still possible. Let us move to the second area. The second area would be climate change. And uh, we have uh, for the uh, 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 we need to have healthy ocean to uh, uh, ensure that there is carbon sink that mitigates climate. And uh, apart from the uh, physical uh, measurements in the system, and you can see how a glider can interact with satellites and send data to, to, to the satellites. Um, we, we can state that, uh, in principle, um, the physical state of the climate system is known really, uh, really better than others. But unfortunately, the biological and ecosystem state are known quite, quite poorly. So what is happening, that, and we know from these uh, measurements that 93 percent of the, of, the uh, of the excess heat due to carbon go to the, goes to the ocean. And this creates, for example, sea level rise. We need to ensure that we have good defensive plans for uh, sea level rise. And uh, for example, uh, in, in the United Nations, in New York, there is a so-called Big U, a plan. But this plan goes for, for big cities and developing countries. What is going to happen uh, due to sea level rise, which is the fastest in the Pacific to Pacific Islands? This is a huge problem. Also requires a lot of science. And then we need to predict, of course, uh, climate not only for the millennia and, and hundreds of years. We need to predict climates for a year ahead to know where we are going to have forest fires, droughts, inundation, cold out, uh, outbreaks. This requires also ocean observing system. And uh, the elements of this observing system exist, but we can really move forward and have good predictions. Predictions, for example, of tropical cyclones, they are enabled by ocean information. But not everyone, again, can do this. So we need a system that would be really measuring capacity and developing capacity. And then it takes me to the area where 
we speak about safety of people. So this is a, a, a picture of the uh, uh, Sumatra tsunami in 2004, total devastation. And after that tsunami, we were able to develop a, a, a system that warns about tsunami around the world. But this system is based on the poor information on ocean mapping. And I can show you, this is the best map of the ocean uh, bottom that we can have based on satellite information, direct measurements. But you know, the resolution of this map is five kilometers. If you look at the map of the Mar of Mars, excuse me, of Mars, this map has 25 times better resolution. And we live on this planet, we don't live on Mars. So this, uh, this picture of total devastation on one beach was avoided. This girl, Tilly Smith, um, went on the beach with her parents. Two weeks before the tsunami, she attended a, a, a lesson given by Andrew Kearney, her teacher in geography, and she was given information about tsunami, how tsunami may look. She warned her parents, her parents reluctantly uh, informed the hotel and moved away from the beach. The beach was evacuated, 100 people were saved. And this is an example how ocean literacy is important. This girl saved lives of 100 people. So uh, we really need to take oceanography into schools. I think this is, will be uh, the, the idea of the decade. Move forward science and take it to people. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know I made a promise. I said that we would take some questions after each of the presentations, but we're running a little bit behind on our time. And so to uh, save some time for questions at the end, we're going to proceed from one presentation to the next. Uh, we're also going to put up another poll, uh, which I'd like you to take a look, up, uh, look at, because it, uh, it sets the stage for uh, Peter Haugen's uh, presentation. Of course, he's the chairperson of the International Oceanographic Commission. And it's basically what we need to know from you about how to take the ocean decade forward. So you've got some multiple choice answers there. Uh, climate, food security, economic growth, sustainable consumption, water and sanitation, and, and education. So take a look at those, provide those answers while I give an introduction to Peter Hogan, who holds a professorship in oceanography at the Geophysical Institute for the University of Bergen and is an adjunct research director uh, at the Institute of Marines Research in Norway as well. His own research has spanned from climate and polar research to marine renewable energy. Peter, we can see from the poll numbers uh, now that uh, where they're going to be taking us, climate is far and away uh, at the uh, top of people's concerns, 76%. Food security at 58, 59%. Education, 34%. Issues related to economic growth at around 30%. So uh, there is at least some framework there for where those concerns are. Um, what's our way forward? How do we move this agenda? Thank you, George, and thank uh, you to all, all who are here. Uh, I'll address the question, but I'd like to start by, by thanking in particular Peter Thompson and Irina Bokova, who has been made clear here through their contributions and the mentioning uh, how important the support we're getting from the IOC when we launch this initiative to bring it to where we are today and, and where we want to, to take it, it forward. Um, in terms of climate and food, uh, definitely um, the ocean plays a, a, a crucial role. Um, what I would like to, to point out here in, in the beginning is that um, we have um, an Ocean Sustainable Development Goal 14, but the kind of idea we put up here when we started to discuss this was that we are not talking about only ocean science in narrow sense to support various pieces of, of marine research. We are talking about all the kinds of science, and with science I mean not only natural science and technology, I also mean social science and humanities. And what we are trying to do is to direct science related services, data exchange, uh, all the things that are needed around science, education, literacy, 
and to actually help the ocean support the 2030 agenda. That's where we want to go with this. This is my perhaps preferred wording of this. Uh, so through the planning, um, the idea for the decade came up very shortly after the adoption of the uh, uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda. And we discussed at IOC uh, the key role of the oceans for the various um, other Sustainable Development Goals and also existing intergovernmental frameworks, disaster risk reduction, small island developing states and climate change. And then the need to manage ocean resources and protect biodiversity in a holistic way and the fact also that large parts of the ocean are beyond national jurisdiction and hosts poorly understood ecosystems motivates a stronger and more coordinated efforts across all nations and, and sectors. And um, I think uh, what uh, already has been said by Vladimir in terms of ocean science, you cannot manage what you do not measure, that certainly applies to the ocean as well. We have science uh, base to, to describe, understand, and in many cases predict um, climate variability. We can predict it on a, beginning to be able to predict it on a monthly to annual timescale, impacts on rainfall, agriculture, other human activities. But those capabilities depend on science, technology, they even depend on long-term observation and the kind of services, sharing of data that maybe may not reach to the top of the political agenda, but which, which are crucial parts. Capacity building in all parts of the world to deploy the systems. So um, the ocean is key. It has been mentioned by others already how much we need rely on the ocean for oxygen, how important it is for climate, food, water, uh, the brew economy, also energy, we may look more and more to the ocean for energy in the future, and human health and employment. So we believe that in order to serve these purposes, what we need is what I would call mission-oriented science. We need to maintain a, a, a close connection between the goals and the, the use of the continuously developing science capabilities. How to characterize a marine ecosystem, understand variability, develop ma management regimes. Only when we use the full power of science can we achieve solutions that work and leave no one behind. And how do we do that? Well, we need to work together. And uh, we have contacted a number of UN bodies, and I probably won't have time to read them all, but it's from Convention on Biological Diversity, Food and Agriculture, World Meteorological, Hydrographic Organization dealing with the seafloor, Seabed Authority, UN Environment, Division of Ocean Affairs and the Law of the Sea, Maritime, also some uh, outside the UN, like the, like the Science Council and, and the, and the uh, partly regional organizations, which want to join in on this and also to invite industry and, and other partners to, to, to join us. So the plan now is that during 2018 and 2019, we will develop a science plan and implementation strategy. We will consult with member states and we will have this planning phase concluded by 2020 and leading back to the United Nations General uh, Assembly before 2021. So we were talking about earlier the link to other SDGs and in particular the link between oceans and the water cycle was mentioned and I think um, um, how we deal with uh, uh, pollution from shore, from, from the land, how we how the ocean provides uh, water to the atmosphere and then to land, pushes these two things together. And if you look at the ocean literacy aspect, we have uh, one of the essential principles there is to link the connectivity between water streams and the ocean. So we certainly need to develop the, the knowledge of students, citizens about this. And um, in fact, we have uh, this year has focused on the ocean goal in the high-level political forum on the, U on the UN. Next year we will have focus on water and I think this is a good opportunity to link together the ocean and water agendas in this, uh, in this context. So that put me at five minutes. Thank you. I'm not going to uh, argue about a few seconds there, Peter. Nicely done. Many thanks. And our next poll uh, is going to uh, set the stage for our next guest, Professor Dato, Dr. Noor Aine Haji Mukhtar, 
Vice Chancellor at the University of Malaysia uh, in Terengganu, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, the poll that we want you to uh, give a, um, a look to is a multiple choice. You're allowed to make uh, three choices among uh, the uh, five that are there. How would the decade of ocean science help you at the national level? How would the decade of ocean science help you at the national level? So as I introduce uh, Dr. Dato, um, tell us what you think about uh, that question and what would be your top three choices. Professor Dato uh, has been involved in teaching, supervising research and consultancies for more than 35 years related to physics, hydraulics, physical modeling, data management, coastal engineering, environment, marine sciences, including climate change, coastal and island studies, as well as strategic and planning policy studies in the areas of R&D, commercialization, technology transfer, and innovation. There is much, much more. I can assure you that for all of our participants here, I have had to truly distill their, uh, my introductions because they have achieved so much in their lifetimes. Dr. Dotto, what can a decade bring in terms of capacity development and transfer of marine technology? You now own the next five minutes. Thank you very much, George. Uh, first, uh, Excellencies, uh, Ministers, uh, uh, IOC members, uh, delegates, um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to show our, my heartfelt gratitude for this invitation to this uh, talk. And I would like to begin with, uh, uh, based on the introduction that my involvement with the university, that um, I would I would say that uh, I would like to introduce the Institute of Oceanography and Marine Science, which is at the University of Malaysia, Terengganu. Uh, it was uh, one of the emerging public universities in Malaysia and the Ministry of Higher Education that has the better cry for soaring upwards to its continuous excellence, that has the slogan, Oceans of Discoveries for Global Sustainability. And in us, this is the Institute as its short form, was established as a significant achievement in marine science and oceanographic research. And it was recommended by the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, IOC or UNESCO, back then in, 2004, in 2001. And again, in 2012, it was, has the status of high center of excellence uh, for the higher education. So since then, um, as I was actually involved as the undersecretary for the National Oceanographic Directorate, Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation, we represented IOC UNESCO. So with this, uh, we believe that uh, we, in the capacity building development, we can share with you, apart from research and teaching, we have the programs. Uh, for example, under the INOS, uh, the three main uh, flight program, which is we have the three approaches to carry out its mandate for research and postgraduate training, particularly. So the first uh, is a set force for the oceanic health and sustainability, uh, including marine environment processes, marine endangered species, the legislative, administrative, and policy. So these are the framework to govern the management of marine environment and resources. So we believe that this initiative, when we teach the UNCLOS, the UN Convention Law of the Sea, it governs the Article uh, 13 under marine scientific research, as well Article 14 for the transfer of technology. So with the questions, as mentioned, uh, we have done uh, IOC programs related to several training. For example, I would like to mention here, through the IOC Westpac and IOC, we have the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Data Information Exchange training back then carried out um, in Kuala Lumpur. We have all the uh, research in related to monsoon, related to the um, uh, ocean teacher training, for example, the, with regards to the data management. So in terms of other programs, uh, one particularly uh, training event that was just recently considered in, in Kuala Lumpur is on the OBIS, ASEAN Notes and Coral Reef Training Course, a training for marine GIS application, as mentioned uh, by Vladimir, that the importance of this. And we have the 
the group of people, back then we had the trainers from Belgium, trainers from Malaysia, trainers from IOC, having the participants from other countries, for example, we have from Bangladesh, Japan, India, Iran, Malaysia, Philippines, and Vietnam. With this, we bring the experts to the region, as well as we have the experts from the region to actually teach from other people. For example, we have our director of InnoCISA that actually talk about GIS and teach Bangladesh, Brazil, China, Fiji, Indonesia, India, Lithuania, Malaysia, and Vietnam. So we do believe that we cooperate with all these member countries with the technology, and we hope that in, the, in, in conjunction with the SDG 2030 and for the Global Ocean Science Report, we believe the components for policies, integration, mainstreaming it for the collaboration and partnership with the various national and government international. We must actually advocate in terms of understand, understanding science elements uh, to measure them and to manage them. So we believe with that report, we are in support of the global, regional, and national data centers transformation for more effective and efficient management of the exchange of ocean data that promote open access. We believe also the ocean science policy interaction from the national to regional and international level provide and encourage stronger active platform where we can promote science and policy interaction at the national Racist voice as one voice in the international fora as we talk about friends of the ocean. We align the national reporting mechanism in the ocean science capacity, productivity, as well as the performance. And we realize that there are group, the sustainable development system, global, actually report um, the, the performance. For example, recently in July 2017, the SDG Global Ranking Index score. So we look at Malaysia, we rank at 54 out of 157 countries. I'm sure other countries also can do better, but we are in that region, we are above average score. So in Malaysia also, we launched recently the book for Rising the Challenge, Malaysia's Contribution to the SDGs. So ladies and gentlemen, we fully support on the framework, the guidelines for development of partnerships, the national level assessment, technical and human capacities, and we continuously to support all the IOC initiatives and programs. And we believe that through the IOC subsidiary, IOC US PAC, and all other um, regional programs, for example, under the Coral Triangle Initiative, Coral Reefs, Fisheries, and Food Security, both uh, bilaterals and multilaterals from IOC member states, we believe that the NGOs, government, the international organization can do it for the next decade Insha'Allah. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Dato. I, well, it's a nice transition into uh, into hearing from our next uh, our next speaker when we start to talk about the engagement of civil society. I just want to draw everyone's attention very briefly to. Uh, the uh, three top uh, selections of how would the decade of ocean science help you at the national level, raising awareness among decision makers at 74%, creating a stronger science policy interface, and raise investments in ocean science. So uh, those were the top three at 74%. 64% and 56%. So clearly there is uh, a lot of interest, again, in raising awareness and education, and a lot of that begins with civil society. Our final poll is going to be not about what you think, it's gonna be about what you're gonna do. Because this poll is gonna ask, how do you propose to contribute to the decade of ocean science. And it is the perfect setup for bringing to the microphone Romain Troublet, who is the executive director of the Tara Foundation, also representing the Ocean and Climate Platform and the Ocean and Climate Initiatives Alliance, and who also happened to produce our next video.
Well done. Coral, it's a, it's a living organism. We have to respect all life. The wonderful video, Romeo. Thank you. Um, I want to um, just uh, uh, go to the poll very quickly. How do you propose to contribute to the decade of ocean science? Uh, this is our lead in as we try to see how we energize civil society. <laughs> Organize public outreach or ocean literacy activities, by far, in the lead with 71%. Uh, develop specific decade program of work, about 49%. And build capacity development activities, about 35%. Uh, so those are uh, the uh, three top uh, vote getters. Romain Troublé has gone from uh, competitive racing in the America's Cup to specializing in polar logistics to unearthing frozen mammoths in Siberia. Troublé is a man of the ocean. No? No? You deny all of that? <laughs> uh, and who sees that engaging in ocean science is about engaging with civil society for sustainable development as a pri priority. How do we catalyze civil society? for the ocean decade, Romain Troublé. Thank you, thank you, George, uh, for the introduction. Peter, and friends of the ocean. Uh, yes, I'm a sailor, I spent a lot, many years of my life in the ocean, sailing the ocean, racing to be fast with a, with a big crew sometimes. And, uh, and I, of course, I like the, the sentence of uh, Irina Bokova saying, we are all in the same boat, only two sur the même bateau. Well, the boat is big, but the ocean is even bigger. And uh, to, to have a boat sailing forward and sailing fast, you have to be all on board and all focused on the, on the challenge and the, and the targets. So having a target like uh, SDGs, having an ocean decade for, for, for science is, of course, a very, very efficient way to trigger actions. That's why I believe. So big ocean, we need all energies. Uh, to, f to find solutions, of course. We need the businesses, we need the people, we need the researchers already, of course. And uh, we need to share this science. We need to share the understanding of, of, uh, of the ocean with the general public. This is very tough for the people. They are very far from the ocean. They, people believe in Paris that they are on the, on the land, that there's nothing to do with the ocean in their daily, daily life. But this, is, this is a challenge for us all. And, uh, this is what we do at the Tara Foundation to try to promote science and explain this science with policymakers, people, and kids. So thanks to the tremendous efforts of the scientific institutions over the last 50, 60 years, we took the pulse of the ocean, we took the temperature of the ocean, we charted the ocean, and, uh, and now we are beginning to take some blood samples. We are beginning to, to look at the biology of the ocean, the medical Technology is now getting into the ocean, looking for DNA, looking for organisms. 80% of, of uh, what we find in the ocean is barely unknown to our uh, databases. So there's a big, big challenge ahead for big data and, and, big, uh, and the future understanding of what the fate will be for the ocean in the future. So as an example, Tara Foundation is a drop in this ocean of actions. Uh, it's 10 years, uh, 11 expeditions, run with the CNRS, French-led scientific institution in France, but also with many, many other countries, scientists. 100,000 kids on board in 62 countries ca came on board. Uh, many, many articles, 20,000 press articles on ocean issues, ocean topics, telling stories about that, and now capacity building in a few countries from uh, in the south, southern uh, 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 developing countries. So this is really to try to make, mind the gap between the science and the people, to try to bring the people on board by, by storytelling, explaining them how it is to be on a boat at sea, how the ocean is important for you and, you and me. And uh, since 3 plus 20 with the IOC of UNESCO, we started as a foundation to support a, a blue pavilion in Flamengo Park in Rio plus 20, talking about uh, uh, the future of BBNG, the future of uh, high, seas in, uh, high seas governance. We followed the SDGs uh, with ocean, at the COP21. We build up with many, many folks on here in the room the Ocean and Climate Platform to try to get to be, to get pe together people to speak with one voice for the Ocean and Climate uh, uh, Agenda. 
Uh, it was a big effort, it was more than 80 institutions from many countries. And when I see the poll, your poll number three, George, I see climate SDG is the, most li the closest link to the ocean. I'm very happy about this 81% of people who are saying, saying yes. This is kind of a success of sharing with civil society the big, the big issues of, of the ocean. And of course now we have the Ocean and Climate uh, Alliance uh, to try to bring forward this action agenda and to try to, to look for solutions for. So for me, for us, all as a civil society uh, uh, alliances, people, is key to, is key to share the science, to, to share this uh, ocean decades, and also it's key to teach the scientists what are the goals we need to look, look at uh, from, the, from the policy to the scientists. It's both ways, I believe. So yes, we are on board for, the, for, the, for this ocean decade, and uh, we are in the starting block, I would say, to follow you and to really bring forward these messages of ocean science need. Thank you. Thank you very much for my... We really only have uh, time for just a couple of questions, and I'm going to ask uh, that uh, the respondents please uh, be uh, to the point. Uh, I'm only going to take a couple, and then I want to leave the rest of the time uh, to Peter Thompson, who I've asked, and, and we expect to see a kind of where is this global, this global approach? How are we going to make this a global approach? Um, Peter Haugen, the one question that I thought I would put to you is how do we turn high-level uh, political momentum into political engagement at the national and local levels? Yeah, I think actually this may be, it's not simple, but it may be more similar than you what would think. Engaging the public engages the political level. I think there's not so much difference between communicating to the public and communicating to non-specialists, whoever they are. And, and so I think the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, educational, informational uh, activities that we need to bring forward can address several audiences at, at, at the same time. And I also think there is, of course, a need to tailor the message to each local conditions. There are different conditions around the world. The, the world is big. We have different cultures, different ways of expressing. And who, who forwards the message is important. But I'm actually quite optimistic looking at the way the UN Oceans Conference worked with voluntary commitments. Yes, there is a call for action, but there are voluntary commitments. And I think the way we want to run this decade is also to, in a similar way, learning from that experience, how can we make people want to come on board, because we cannot force anybody to come on board. This is a voluntary exercise, and, and we want to, to, to convince people and, and to be involved in actually defining it as well. Uh, Roma, I'm going to come to you for one minute on, on, on the second question, because you've kind of straddled this uh, both uh, from being a, a businessman and also to having the foundation. And the question is actually a very important question because achieving SDG 14 without the business community, uh, business leaders buying into it uh, would make it a, a, a heavy lift. So how do we appeal to people who are essentially, uh, in many cases, perhaps even exploiting the oceans in way to uh, up their stock prices uh, or otherwise uh, just simply make money. You've got 60 seconds. Uh, I think with the businesses, when I speak about businesses, I don't speak about only about the uh, ocean businesses. I think today when we meet uh, businesses in France and everywhere in Asia as well, we, you, tell to them, you, you tell them about the importance of the ocean for sustainability and uh, they don't see, the, they don't see the, the problem. They don't have any clue about the problem. So first is to explain uh, to them what the stakes are, what we talk about, and then is to engage them at the global level to, to, to support these efforts in science, in research. These people are very sensitive to science, to research. They do this in their business every day. So they can understand this link, I think. Thank you very much. Okay, at this time, I think it's important for us to try to bring this together, and I'm going to turn my attention to Peter Thompson. 
uh, Ambassador Peter Thompson, who is the special envoy on the oceans, who is attempting to, to bring it together so that we can, we can raise this awareness that we can begin in 2021 with the ocean decade. Peter Thompson, you've uh, heard some very excellent uh, contributions uh, from the panelists. We've had a few good questions from, uh, from our audience. Uh, where do you see the thread? You get, you get three minutes. If I can beg the indulgence of the, of the translators to be, with, to be with us for the next three minutes. Oh, we get five. Thank you. Uh, listening to all these... Look, I think uh, in terms of sum up, uh, for member states present, uh, there is a very strong message that needs to go out to all member states now, 193. There's some huge responsibilities out there of things that need to come together um, and uh, obviously supporting the uh, international decade for marine science for sustainable development is one of the responsibilities that member states have got on their plate and need to uh, take to a responsi responsible delivery before the end of this year. I think December is when we're targeting for uh, that to be adopted. And that's one thing for member states. At the same time, we have the BBNJ discussions going on, you know, the biodiversity beyond national jurisdictions. This is absolutely essential work for the, the health of the ocean. And this, again, uh, is now resting with member states to agree that we have uh, the conference and, and set a date for it, to set this new international law in place so that we'll no longer have piracy when it comes to uh, life out there in, in the high seas. Uh, at the same time, member states are getting together for the World Trade Organization meeting in Buenos Aires, where one of the really important things that's going to be discussed is fisheries subsidies, uh, where we have the ridiculous situation where we're still giving fishing sub fisheries subsidies to fleets where we have overcapacity over chasing diminishing fish stocks. I mean, where is the rationality in that for humanity as a whole? So these are uh, you know, things that member states have got to deal with. And I include in that the, the mandating of a 2020 UN conference. Now, to be fair to member states, that is not yet on the plate, but it soon will be. So these are all parts of the new responsibility that we have uh, as uh, member states. And I speak there as a, a long-serving uh, civil servant and, and a represent, representative of a country. Um, so um, the, the other wrap-up thing that I would say is that I saw questions on the, I was following the polls, and there were questions about what's the special envoy actually going to be doing to uh, make all this happen. Uh, Now's so your time. Other than, other than being going, uh, going around the world, basically being a, a salesman, and believe me, I'm on a plane every second day for SDG 14, uh, it's a matter of getting a strategy in place that's going to take us through to success by 2030. And, and, and because I'm the age I am, I'm looking at a three-year horizon. I'm looking at 2020. I want to get us to a point of accountability globally in 2020 where we sit down and say, how are we doing? Right? So we've got three years. Everybody needs to be thinking in terms of three years of action here. In 2020, we're going to sit down again. We're going to look at our successes and failures. We're going to readjust because we will then have a decade ahead of us, backed up by this decade of marine science that is coming forward, but we will have a decade of implementation left to us. But we need that amount, that, that moment of truth in 2020 to see how we're traveling and to make the readjustments uh, and to uh, put in place what is necessary for us to achieve success in SDG 14 by the time of its maturation in 2030. And just before um, the translators uh, abandoned me, um, the 1,400 voluntary commitments were mentioned. Uh, be assured that we are working on making those meaningful. Uh, what is happening, uh, in fact, for the last three months has been happening, is in the United Nations uh, Department, uh, DESA it's called, it's the biggest department, uh, economic and social affairs at the United Nations. We've been uh, grouping those 1,400 commitments into nine different communities based on what their areas of interest are. There's, as you know, over 500 that are interested in marine science. So one of the communities is marine science. Uh, there are nine of these communities going for like coral, fisheries, marine science, ocean governance, mangroves, etc. And these nine communities are going to be put into communities of ocean action. 
and I'm going to New York at the end of this month to spend a week to launch these in webinars, global webinars, these nine communities of ocean action. Each will be led by co-chairs, very senior people in the world, uh, and all you have to be, uh, 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 to be a member of any one of those communities of action, of ocean action, all you have to do is register a voluntary commitment. That register is open. Many of you are already on that register, so you will be getting emails inviting you to these uh, webinars, which we'll be holding the last week of this month. So uh, be aware that that's all happening as well, uh, and that one of those is science-focused. So uh, I would just conclude on the fact that there's nothing here that I've heard today or read, read on the uh, the uh, polls that are coming through that uh, doesn't say otherwise than that the um, international decade of ocean science for sustainable development 2021 to 2030 is anything other than a marvelous idea, but uh, is also absolutely essential for us to achieve the success of SDG 14. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to uh, thank uh, our translators for indulging us uh, for the extra five minutes so that we could wrap it up so beautifully and so completely with the words of Ambassador Peter Thompson. Thank you so very much. I want to thank all of the members of our panel for their excellent contributions, the speakers, of course, the Director General who joined us earlier, and the members of the IOC Secretariat, who you also have seen some of them were very instrumental, well, all of them were very instrumental in making this event possible, and their contributions helped to inform the process of how we would bring this forward. I also would like to uh, just very quickly mention a couple of other people who are in the background. Ksenia Ivanich from uh, the IOC, uh, Rajan Hervé Smaja as well from the IOC, Vinny Lindoso who is handling the Slido and doing a wonderful job with that, and Aya Khalil who is also there helping out with uh, the uh, technology that we've been doing. And I want to thank all of you. I want to thank you for your participation. I want to thank you for your attention. And I want to thank you for, for, for truly being a part of the solution. I wish you all, oh, I forgot the technicians. Thank you guys up in the corner for keeping me on mic and everybody else in the, uh, in the game. Again, thank you all. Let's do it for the oceans. Have a great and wonderful afternoon.